Hello, my name is John Gibbons, and I wanted to thank the Sports Therapy Association for inviting me on as a guest lecturer. They did say to me if I could pre-record a subject, and I thought it'd be quite good to review, if you like, the anatomy of a knee complex. I guess I could have done anything in reality, like the shoulder or the hip or the ankle and the foot, but I thought I quite like the knee. Um, and a lot of people struggle with the knee in terms of assessing and treating, etc. But um, if we review it, and as I go through, I will give you a little, well, a few little snippets, as I say, as I go through, then I'm hoping that you might take something from it. Because every, in the field of sports therapy, if you like, I think they know a lot about the anatomy. But um, I plan to write a, a book on the vital knee complex and I will probably write over mm, probably 80 90 thousand words so it's a, a lot of information that um, I'm planning to write I've actually written a lot of it already because I run an online course and this lesson's already been completed and uh, it's part of the lesson one from my online vital knee complex course so um, it'd be nice if you're able to download and then you can just watch it from time to time. But uh, what you have to remember with the knee, as complex as it is, I do believe it's quite rare in some respects that you actually get knee pain that's a causative factor of the joint in itself. Many years ago, there was a lady called Dr. Ida Rolf, and she had an idea where she talked about where the pain is the problem is not. And I'm a firm believer of what she said. Now, I always say to my students that I teach that the knee joint is a weak link in the chain. And what I mean by that is, if you do have knee pain, then you have to look at the hip joint because any pathological change within the hip, and that could mean things like a labral tear, femoral acetabular impingements, but especially things like osteoarthritis. And don't expect you know, everybody to have osteoarthritis when they're in a certain age bracket, because I've seen women in their mid-30s where they've got a hip pathology, but it refers to the knee. There's even a condition in children called, it sounds a bit weird, okay, so it's, it's, it's perf disease really, but it's called leg calve perf disease, or perf s as one would call it, and this was named after three surgeons, um, Arthur Leg, which sounds a bit strange, Jackie Calve and uh, Georges Perfes. So that is a malformation of a ball in a socket, as in like the femoral head. And instead of being an, a normal shape, it becomes a mushroom shape. And it normally affects boys around 8 to 12, give or take. And uh, they normally present with knee pain. So um, just bear that in mind that, you know, if you've got someone where they present with knee pain, then as I said, you know, you need to, to at least rule out the hip joint and do the typical sort of Faber test in particular, as in the person crosses a leg. You also have to look at the lumbar spine because chiropractic philosophy will be that, you know, you need to look at L3, L4. You can look at the position of the pelvis because anything, if it's dysfunctional, like a rotation of the anterior innominate, which is quite common, will also cause altered biomechanical influence to the knee joint. And if you're a podiatrist, no doubt, if you see patients with knee pain, you are going to look at the biomechanics of the foot and ankle complex. And more than likely, you are probably going to prescribe an orthose, like an orthotic. Whereas if you're a sports therapist, we're not really trained to do that. But we still will need to consider if the dysfunction is coming from, even like the great toe, if a great toe, the hallux cannot extend, it will compensate. If the ankle, like the tailor crural joint, cannot dorsiflex, then it will compensate through the subtalar joint. And then what that means is the subtalar joint causes the pronation, which then takes the tibia with it, which then alters the, the motion of the knee. And before you know it, you have, you know, painful patella syndrome, that sort of thing. So, um, just, just bear that in mind. So let's do a little recap on the anatomy. Let me, I've got my pen here, so I'm just gonna add a few things. So we've got a, quite a few images as we go through this. You can read this in your own time. But when people talk about the knee joint, it's obviously the femur and the tibia. A lot of people think it's the patella, but the patella which articulates within the femur 
underneath here, okay, with menistropylia groove underneath. So this is the patella femoral joint, which is a synovia glidin. The actual knee joint is actually called the tibio femoral joint, okay, so the tibia on the femur, so the tibio femoral, which is a, we can call it a synovial joint. A lot of people say it's a hinge joint, it's incorrect, because a hinge joint will only flex and extend. Whereas this, you can call it a bicondylar because you've got the condyles of the femur articulating the condyles of the tibia, either side, bi, okay, so two either side. But you can also call it a atypical hinge joint, which actually means it's not atypical. Sounds a bit strange, yeah, but then when you add in the letter A to typical, so atypical means it's not atypical. Um, I always say that to my students and I think it always confuses them. Um, we'll discuss a few things as we go through, like the sesamoid bone, all right, this is a a bone that grows within the tendon, the quadricep tendon comes down, and then we've got the patella tendon that comes off, even though it's not really a tendon, it's the ligamentum patelli that comes off here, and it attaches to the tibial tuberosity along here. And then this bit, the tibial tuberosity, like a tubercle, a trochanter, etc., you know, they're all, all similar, just different sizes. But this one in particular, so the tuberosity of the tibia is actually the apophysis of the tibial bone. And the apophysis is like where a major tendon attaches. So the calcaneus would be the, the apophysis of the heel bone, where the Achilles will attach. And if you have an inflammatory issue along here, then there is a condition, you might know it, affects boys in particular, even though girls can sustain it. And it's called an Osgood Schlatter's disease. And it's named after, I'll give you a second to, you know, see if you know this one. So it's named after two surgeons called Robert Osgood and Carl Schlatter, and it was actually named many, many years ago, as in like 1903. Yes, yeah, so what's that, 118 years ago. Uh, but, you know, it's still a, a common sort of condition that affects uh, you know, early teens, if you like, 13, 14, yeah, and so on. By the time they're 18, 19, yeah, they would have grown out of that. Let's move on. So there's a couple of pictures on here, or images. Um, not really that relevant in some ways, because it's for FEMA. We are only looking at the distal femur, whereas the proximal femur obviously articulates with the hip joint along here. So we've got the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle, which epi is just above, okay, on top of, like here. So for instance, if you have an IT band friction syndrome, it rubs around the lateral epicondyle just here uh, and gives you that sort of friction type of syndrome. Um, this is where the patella sits. So basically, this will be like an articular cartilage along here. Uh, and then the groove will be known as the trochlea groove where the, uh, the patella sits in. So you'll have like patella femoral pain syndrome along here. The intercondylar, so inter is, is between the condyles, a fossa is like a depression. So the space along the sort of area where the sort of cruciate will sort of sit in there. The shaft medically is called the diaphysis along here, but we don't really need to discuss yeah, further up into the hip for this one. A few things on this image along here. Uh, we've got the interosseous membrane along here because that's interesting because this tib fib joint, which is the proximal tibia fibula joint, is a synovial gliding joint here. But the distal part, even though it's connected part of the same bone, is actually a syndesmosis joint, which is a type of fibrous joint. So it's connected by this membrane called the interosseous. So this is synovial and then this is a fibrous type of joint. And the head of the fibula you know, one would say, but it's not really part of a knee. But if you have a hamstring issue, the bicep femoris will attach onto here. And if a bicep femoris is a tendinopathy, just at this distal attachment, then it might well be because the head of the fibula doesn't move as well as it should. Why? Because the person has gone over on her ankle a month or two ago and is all healed. But as a result, it caused the distal tip fib joint to change the proximal tip fib joint to change and then the insertion of the bicep femoris to become irritated. So I suggest if you've got bicep femoris tendinopathy, then maybe look at the motion of the head of the fibula and also the motion of the ankle joint in here. Okay, it's not really part of my talk, but I'm just giving you some ideas. So we tell up the sesamoid bone. You've also got sesamoid uh, like the pisiform within the flexor carpi ulnaris. You've got two sesamoids under the great toe, which is called the hallux and that's underneath the flexor hallucius brevis. But if you turn it over, you will see there is what we call the facets. Um, so you've got the medial facet here, all right, which articulates with the medial femoral condyle, and then you've got the lateral facet here, which articulates with the lateral femoral condyle. There's also an odd facet, we can't really see it on here. Um, so 
If these are irritated, then you're going to have like patella femoral pain type of syndromes. On children, you can call it the chondromalacia patella. One would call it the maltracking type of syndrome. Uh, on the older patient, you might call it a retropatellar osteoarthritis because it changes um, the sort of consistency of, because this is hyaline cartilage along, and it's pretty thick. It's quite a few millimeters thickness too here. So it takes a, quite a bit of effort, if you like, to wear it down. But once it starts wearing, um, like chondrocartilage malacia is a softening of, and um, you know you might find that you get this irritation behind. Um, this is a tricky one in some ways because you've got this female who's 15, and the doctor says, well, she's got CMP, chondromalacia, but she's naturally growing the quadratus angle, if you like, the quad, quadricep angle is called the Q angle, is increasing because she's developing her sort of like natural shape of the hip and the angle of the knee, etc. So no doubt, young women in particular, you know, you might find that it hurts going up and down stairs, but downstairs in particular. A tricky one to treat because once she's gone past the stage, as in like, you know, once she's developed, then you might find that the symptoms might start to reduce. But during about one or two years, when she's get that chondromalacia, can be quite debilitating. So, um, yeah. So let's move on. Uh, synovial joints, the, uh, that's an interesting one. The fabella. Not many people know about the fabella here, okay? So the fabella, if you read about it, it's called, like, means the little bean. There's no picture of it, sadly. Um, so it's more common in males, I'm not sure why. And even more common in Asia. So I'm not sure if I've seen it. I reckon I have. It's interesting because on an x-ray, the fabella is located underneath the lateral head of the gastrocnemius tendon. But it can be mistaken for like a loose body. And loose body is within the knees, like an OCD. So it's called an osteochondritis dissecans. But also that could mean, um, another nickname for it is what we call an IDKJ. Sounds a bit strange. Medically, it's called an internal derangement of a knee joint. But what you're basically saying is, I don't know Jack or I don't know John. Um, so if someone has a loose body where they'll get that sort of locking sensation, almost like a meniscal sort of tear, but a bit more of it, this is like potentially a palpable chondro bone, like osteochondro bone within the, 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 the joint of the tibiofemoral joint that's floating around and sometimes it's going to get caught. And you might see it on x-ray if it's the loose body. Whereas the fabella, which is the sesamoid within the lateral head of a gas rock, but only in 40% of individuals, um, doesn't move because it's located within. So that's a, a little interesting concept there. Let's move on. Uh, the bursa, there are many bursas, lots of bursas. Some would say there's potentially 16 bursas around the knee. Um, but some of them, they're almost like just like a little empty balloon, but just like a sack. So this pre patella bursa here, I've actually got a YouTube video of a pre patella bursitis. Amazingly, it has over 6 million views, and it's just a, a 38 second video of one of my patients where they had a pre patella bursa because they fell on it on a bike. And then you, we have this swelling, and it's called an house, housemaid's knee, just here. You can also get a swelling below called the, this is a superficial infra patella. And then we have one called the deep infrapatella because it's obviously under the patella tendon. This one's in front of. One would call this like a carpet layer's knee or prayer's knee. There's lots of names for, for these type of things along here. But they are what they are. You know, the bursa is swollen but outside the joint capsule. Um, so they're extra capsular, capsular swellings. There is one here, this is an interesting one, called the supravitella pouch. But one calls the bursa. It's sort of incorrect because this pouch is a continuation of a synovial membrane of the knee joint here. And uh, you don't see it, but this pouch is held in place by, if I do it here, just there, there's a little muscle called, uh, it's called genu, which relates to the knee. So genu, genu. And it's called the articularis. So genu articularis has like two insertion points onto the pouch. And basically when the knee flexes and extends, but it keeps this pouch in position here. Um, and there's one at the back, this is, um, well, the synovium membrane, but you can't really see it, but it, it continues. You know, there's one called the subtendinous bursa, the gastroc, but don't worry about this one. So the synovium membrane at the back continues, and then if that's swollen, we have what we call a popliteal bursitis, and one would call it like a baker's cyst along here. 
Okay, so named after Baker uh, at the back. And um, so you get this swelling. Uh, but when the knee sort of like flexes and extends, it obviously translates the fluid anteriorly. Okay, and when you flex the knee, it then translated posteriorly. So that natural motion almost like lubricates the, the fluid within. So even though they call bursas, they're not really bursas, they're pouches. So you've got this superior pouch or the superpatellar pouch, and you have a posterior pouch in there, which is called the popliteal. Uh, but then if a knee is swollen, the fluid has to go somewhere. So it tends to transmit itself up within here. And then you can do what we call a ballotman test where you push your fluid down, the patella will, will sort of lift like here. Okay, then you can ballot the patella or bounce it, and then it bounces in the fluid. And behind you tend to get this egg. Yeah, so if I do this, you tend to get this sort of like egg shape around you. But be careful of the posterior part of the knee, because sometimes it could relate to like a rheumatoid arthritis, because that tends to affect the, the, the synovium, all right, of the joint. There's lots of them versus we can't really see them, yeah, within here. Uh, tibia femoral ligament, uh, a joint I meant there. Uh, some of the ligaments along here. Um, let's just run through a little bit more of the anatomy. So you've got the cruciate ligament here, so the anterior cruciate ligament, and then the posterior cruciate ligament just behind it. So the anterior cruciate ligament prevents anterior glide of the tibia in relation to the femur, and posterior glide of the femur in relation to the tibia. Okay, And then the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament, will prevent posterior motion of the uh, tibia in relation to the femur, an anterior motion of the femur in relation to the tibia. Well, there's a handful in it. Yeah, that those terminologies there. Well, I mentioned an interosseous membrane, and there's the ligament along here. So it says anterior ligament, but it's called the anterior superior tibia fibula ligament along here. Yeah, this is the LCL, so the lateral collateral ligament, which literally you can see there's a separation in between because it's like a, a ligament is roughly four to six centimeters long. Um, it's it's not really connected to the capsule, whereas this one is the medial collateral ligament and is connected to the joint capsule here and also to the medial meniscus in there. So if you have damage to one structure, you can have damage to the other. Whereas an LCL is normally damaged in isolation, but saying that the LCL is involved with PCL issue and MCL damage is involved with ACL issue. These are intracapsular ligaments, so they're inside the joint capsule. And then these ones here are called the collaterals and they are outside the joint capsule along here. Here we've got the IT band, so the iliotubular band, but it connects to what we call the Gerdes tubercle, named after a French surgeon called Nicholas Gerdy, which just goes to this bony landmark just there. And fascially, it connects into the tibialis anterior, okay? So you can't see it, but it comes down into that. Bicep femoris is connected here, yeah, uh, along there. The popliteus tendon, that's an interesting structure. So the popliteus will well, basically, well, when you flex the knee, it will rotate the tibia uh, medially in relation to the femur. But when you lock the knee, um, it will, um, well, it depends on whether it's like an open chain or closed chain. Let me explain that. So if you, if you just curl, if you stand in and you bend your knee, then the tibia is, relate, uh, is rotating medially in relation to the femur. Whereas if you stand in and you bend in, then the femur will rotate laterally to unlock uh, in respect to the tibia. Okay, so um, yeah, so it can do both things. It can medially rotate the tibia on the femur and laterally rotate the femur in relation to the tibia. This is called the pes anserinus. So you've got these three, three tendons along here. So you've got SGT, known as the sergeant SGT in the military. Okay, so sart oh, S sartorius gracilis semitendinosus, which is T. Okay, so you've got SGT. Sartorius gracilis tendinosus, semitendinosus. So this is the pes foot, okay, as in the goose foot, which attaches to this medial aspect of the tibia. And actually, there's a bursa here, and it'll call it the pes anserinus bursa. Uh, there's the, the tibial ligament or the medial collateral ligament along here, okay, so tibial or the medial collateral ligament on there. Uh, moving on, uh, just I mentioned most of these already, but um, quite nice pictures up. Yeah, so from here, you can see the undersurface, you can see the medial facet and patella, the lateral facet, the ligament and patella, yeah, along here. We would call it the patella tendon, but actually medically it's called the ligament and patella. You can see the cruciates here, the fibular ligament, also known as the lateral collateral, tibial, 
we know it as the medial collateral. So same thing, just a slightly different name yeah, along here. Um, the tibial is roughly six to nine centimeters, give or take. It prevents the knee from going into valgus. And then the fibular ligament or the lateral ligament prevents the knee from going into varus uh, along here. Um, yeah, that's okay. So we've mentioned all them. Let's go through. There's like a joint capsule of the knee and some other ones called the oblique and arcuate popliteal ligaments along here, around there. So there's, you know, it just it doesn't really end. You can see the, the attachments of certain muscle groups around here. You have a medial head of the gastrox, the bursa in there, the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. That's where the fabella would, would be located within here, that little P-shaped, you know, a little bean as it's called, uh, the fibula. Okay, so you can see all these little blue things, the bursa, there's loads of them. Yeah, everywhere around here. Uh, I mentioned the cruciates. You can see the anterior cruciate here. I think there's a better picture on the next one around that area. So let's have a look at that one. Yeah, I quite like this picture along here. So the anterior cruciate, like you can't get to the cruciates, so you have to test them typically by doing the anterior draw test, uh, the pivot shift test, or the Lachman's maneuver. Um, so to test that, the ACL is more commonly torn compared to the PCL. You can suffice without the PCL if you rupture this, if you've got a full thickness tear of it. Whereas with an ACL, you probably would need surgery because it leads on to degenerative changes within the knee quite, well, not quite soon, but if you had arthritis at 60, if you've got a deficient ACL, you probably have it around 53, 4, depending. If it does tear, um, you'll have a hemarthrosis where the knee basically swells very quickly within one to two hours. Whereas if a knee has a synovial effusion, it would probably swell within around 12 to 24 hours. Yeah, so if a patient says, well, I felt a pop in my knee, and then it gives way like a pivot shift type of motion, then um, you probably suspect an ACL. If you do a test on it, the draw test, you might find it's positive. The meniscus here, these are almost like, like gum shields. Um, you can see this is almost like a closed C-shaped, okay, the lateral meniscus, and then the medial meniscus is almost like what they call an open C along here. And you get different types of tear, radial tear, longitudinal tears, bucket handle tears, and the list goes on. But if you've got a, um, a posterior tear, it's commonly to have a posterior horn at the back here, so on the medial. So if you've got a posterior horn tear of a medial meniscus, you'll probably find uh, full flexion will be painful at the back of the knee, so you'll be limited to full flexion. Uh, you can also get limitation of full extension. Why? Because when the tibia and femur lock, then you have what they call a screw hole mechanism. And if you have a meniscal tear that's in the way, then the knee cannot lock home. So you have what they call a fixed flexion deformity of that. Uh, so just bear that in mind as you're assessing. Um, yeah, I quite like this picture as well. One here. So this is, you can see it here. Yeah. And this is a transverse ligament. So this is the, the cruciate ligament, which goes from the anterior aspect of the tibia to the posterior aspect of the femur here. All right. So it basically prevents the, the tibia from gliding anteriorly. Yeah. Or the femur from gliding posteriorly along here. Whereas the PCL will, will do the opposite. You can see the tibial collateral ligament here. You can see how it attaches directly. So we've got a deep fiber. We can see it just there. And then we've got a superficial fiber that's actually in different bands. So we've got a, like an where we, anterior and a mid fiber and a posterior fiber of the superficial ligament. Uh, and then we've got a deep fiber which attaches to the medial meniscus on its lateral edge here there. So if we damage A, you probably damage B and also attaches to the, the joint capsule. So, um, so which means it, it can swell. And you can see here the synovial membrane. So it's almost like extra synovia. Yeah, the actual, you know, you can see it around here, the synovium where it comes around. Um, so yeah, the bursa we've already mentioned, um, but you can see um, some of them here, which we've already gone through. And I think we are, we are there on that. So I'm hoping that um, you learned a few little things. Um, no doubt if you have any questions, I'm quite easy to found, find, yeah. So um, you can you can just search for me, John Gibbons Bodymaster.co.uk. I do have some online courses, uh, and if you put in uh, STO15, then it gives you 15% discount on all the online stuff. So if you do have any questions, yeah, then then get in touch, and I'm sure uh, I can answer them. Um, so.
Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'm sure I will see you at some point, probably on a course or at a lecture somewhere, yeah, or even at the Therapy Expo in November. Thanks again.